This was the scene at the COVID inquiry a few moments ago. The last few weeks have been building to this moment today. Boris Johnson, the man who was ultimately responsible for the decisions taken during the pandemic, being questioned about how he made those life and death decisions. This is Politics Live. Joining me today, Labour MP Stella Creasy, Conservative MP Sir Simon Clark, the SNP's Alan Smith and the Telegraph's Camilla Tomini. On today's programme... I understand the feelings of, the, of these victims and their families and I am deeply sorry for the pain and the loss and the suffering of those victims. An apology from Boris Johnson at the start of two days of evidence to the Covid inquiry. But the former Prime Minister insists he got the big calls right. With hindsight, it may be easy to, to see things that we could have done uh, differently, or it may be possible to see things that we could have done differently. At the time, I felt, and I know that everybody else felt, that uh, we were doing our best in very difficult circumstances to protect life and, and protect the NHS. We'll bring you the latest as Mr Johnson continues to give evidence. We feel very strongly that this treaty addresses all the issues raised by their lordships in the uh, Supreme uh, Court. A new treaty. Now will new laws put asylum seekers on planes to Rwanda? All that and Prime Minister's questions live at noon. Yes, Boris Johnson, the former Prime Minister, has been giving evidence to the Covid inquiry for just over an hour. You heard part of his apology at the very beginning of that evidence session in our headlines. Let's listen to the full apology from him. Can I just say how glad I am to be at this uh, inquiry and uh, how sorry I am for the, the pain and the loss and the suffering sit down. of please, the please stop. COVID Johnson. victims. Please sit down. Please sit down or I'm afraid you'll have to leave the hearing room. I'm sorry, if you don't sit down, I'm going to ask the ushers to get you to leave. Right, could, ushers, please, could you ask them to leave? Could I say, by your leave, uh, that I understand the feelings of, the, of these victims and their families, and I am deeply sorry for the pain and the loss and the suffering of those victims and, and their families. And grateful though I am to the hundreds of thousands of healthcare workers uh, and many other public servants and people in all walks of life who helped to protect our country throughout a dreadful pandemic, I do hope that this inquiry will help to get the answers to the very difficult questions that uh, those victims and those families are, are rightly are asking so that we can protect ourselves better, help each other to help protect ourselves better in the future and prevent further suffering. So that was the opening there from Boris Johnson making a pretty full comprehensive uh, apology there, an apology broadly about the decisions uh, that were taken by him and his government during the COVID pandemic. We will go through the detail of what else has been presented by the former Prime Minister, um, but my colleague, uh, the correspondent Nick Erdley, is outside the inquiry for us. Um, a very serious start by Boris Johnson. He's been preparing for this, we understand, for almost a year. What did you make of his demeanour and the opening remarks in the inquiry? Yeah, Joe, it was interesting because, as you might expect, it was pretty sober. There were some people in the room who were clearly unhappy with that apology. They were thrown out for interrupting Mr Johnson. And what was also interesting, though, was although you got that unreserved apology, as he put it at the start, there were 
clearly points at which he wanted to start to build the defence. We've only seen the broad outline of that so far, but after that unreserved apology, Mr Johnson was also saying we were doing our best in very difficult circumstances. He was talking about him changing his mind, he said, because the signs kept changing. So, look, yes, absolutely, as we expected, as was trailed by Team Johnson, there was an apology. I think it's important to point out there were some caveats to it as well, that Mr Johnson is still saying we, we did our very best with the information we had at the time. I mean, he also answers the question about personal responsibility and accountability. Um, Hugo Keith, uh, leading counsel, lists all of the big decisions that were made, and he is very clear he is and was ultimately responsible, didn't he? Yeah, he was, and the question was put to him, well, if you're unreservedly apologising, what are you mm. apologising for? And it was interesting that the one example that Mr Johnson started to dwell on was messaging and how the government had got its arguments across. But he then said that at this stage anyway, he doesn't want to get into a hierarchy of what the government got right and wrong. I think we will inevitably get more of that over the next couple of days as we go into a bit more of the detail. What we've seen so far has been more of a broad overview. And as I say, Mr Johnson doesn't want to get into saying this is what we got wrong, this is what we got right at this stage. But it was also, I thought, fascinating in the last half hour or so that some of the things we've talked a lot about at the inquiry over the last few weeks, the criticisms of how government was functioning, they were put to Mr Johnson. We've seen messages that show Mr Johnson saying in July 2020, so a year before Matt Hancock left his job, saying that Mr Hancock was unfit for the job as Health Secretary. We've seen messages from Simon Case, who was the incoming Cabinet Secretary, saying that he'd never seen a bunch of people less well equipped to run a government. Now, Boris Johnson's argument is that we're seeing WhatsApp messages that you would never normally see, and that's bound to paint a picture of some of the arguments that go on in government. But it feels to me like that's a point that is going to be put to Mr Johnson time and time again. That, Quite frankly, despite you saying that you were doing your best with the information you had, there were real tensions in government which suggest that at the very heart of the decision-making process, things weren't working. Right, and as you say, he's asked Boris Johnson, when you are apologising, what you are apologising for, were they the wrong decisions or do they only seem wrong now in hindsight? You've pointed to the language and the culture that existed in government and we've seen that reflected throughout this COVID inquiry. Has Boris Johnson given a defence in any way that is convincing about the fact that the sort of toxicity that we've seen exposed by the messages and evidence of other uh, people, politicians and civil servants at the inquiry, that that didn't affect negatively the decisions that were made? Well, his argument, it's an interesting argument, is that this often happens in highly functioning governments. He was citing the administrations of Margaret Thatcher and Tony Blair, saying you often had powerful and you know, colourful characters who clashed with one another when they were discussing policy. So I think part of his argument is going to be that it's actually fine to have people arguing and being a bit sweary in WhatsApp groups if they deliver the right outcomes. And he will argue, I think, that on the, the big calls, the government still got a lot of things right. But, Joe, do you know what? It comes back to that question. That Matt Hancock point, I think, is a really important one. Boris Johnson is saying that Matt Hancock's unfit for the job. There's some language in that message that I won't read out at this time on BBC Two, but effectively saying that Matt Hancock was a liar and that he was more interested in talking to the media than doing his job. This is a year before Matt Hancock eventually left his job as health secretary and as we know Boris Johnson didn't sack him at any point he resigned over that um, that picture that emerged in the sun of him kissing his aide in contravention of the the COVID rules at the time so I think one of the questions that Mr Johnson will inevitably face is if you thought this guy was rubbish at his job and couldn't do it properly why did you keep him in place that goes to the very heart of how government was working at the time. Arguments are fine, but if you think people are rubbish, 
Why did you keep them in the post? Nick Hurdley, thank you very much. And just to let our viewers know, of course, we are following uh, the inquiry. A team of people are listening to all the evidence being presented and we will be playing you um, excerpts uh, from the Prime Minister's evidence. But let me just bring in our panel here. Um, Stella, first of all, you heard the apology mm -hmm. there. I don't know how much else uh, you've heard from Boris Johnson's evidence. What do you make of that? Uh, look, he had to apologise very clearly. We're at the early stage now of the response, so let's see then what that means in practice. And I think that's the, the very clear question, isn't it? OK, if you're saying you got things wrong, mm. what are you saying you got wrong and why? Clearly already we've seen evidence of a massively toxic, dysfunctional, disorganised number 10 at a time of high need for people to be working together, working clearly, listening to the scientists, working out what to do about a, a, a crisis. I think we need to see what Boris Johnson feels was leadership on his terms and what was the ambiguity at the time. So yes, absolutely, our understanding of the virus developed as time went on and, and how it was transmitted, but an environment where everybody was swearing at each other, arguing about who was more important, who was top dog, was anybody really listening to each other? You know, the evidence from the chief science people has been pretty damning about how decisions were being made. Yes. You add that into a culture where nobody was listening to each other, I think he's got a lot to apologise for. Simon? Well, I wasn't in the Cabinet in the first uh, iteration of Covid. I was for the 2021 uh, period. And, I mean, I can say that what the, Prime, the former Prime Minister is, is, has been saying is, is fundamentally true, which is that, uh, obviously, there is a need to apologise for mistakes that were made. And, you know, I, I would add my own apology uh, to, to, to his. But the, the science was fast moving and often contradictory. Uh, and sometimes it was flat wrong. Uh, so one of the things which I think we will need to look at uh, is, is, is obviously in, in, in a open and generous minded spirit, the decisions that the prime minister got right at the time, notably, uh, I think in the winter of 2021, when you had uh, the new variant emerge, uh, Omicron, and there was a lot of scientific pressure to lock down again. That was the unambiguous advice mm. of the scientific community. And I will confess that, you know, without breaching wider cabinet confidentiality, I argued to lock down again at that point. Did you? Boris resisted. Uh, and his so, explanation. And, and his explanation. And, and let this would doubtless come up in the, mm. in, in the weeks, uh, well, the hours and, uh, and weeks ahead. Uh, and he resisted and he was right, because actually we did not need to lock down at that point. The disaster did not unfold. It's these counterfactuals well. which need to be caught as well as the alternative uh, lines of attack. And I think in a balanced inquiry, we do need to capture that. Boris got a lot of things right, which may never properly be fully articulated unless we get them on record now. Uh, do you accept that? I mean, Scottish Government was also making these life and death uh, decisions uh, alongside uh, Boris Johnson and the government of which Simon uh, was later a part of. But there is that key element of discussions and decisions made on lockdowns and the timing of lockdowns. And Boris Johnson has already said this morning that the risk of going too early into lockdown, the first lockdown, we're talking about March 2020, because of what he called behaviour or behavioural fatigue, was a powerful one. Mm. Do you accept that these were all very difficult decisions to make? There were fine judgments and balances um, in a pandemic that none of us had experienced before. Of, of course they were. And the Scottish government agonised with this in the same way as the UK government did. I think, I think Stella's point is the most important one about what sort of organisational culture was there in making those decisions. Now, Nicola Sturgeon, as a former health secretary, took personal charge of this very early on from the Scottish government's perspective. And that allowed a focus and a seriousness, frankly, which, uh, which allowed us to communicate what we needed to communicate. And I, I was really glad to hear Boris Johnson say sorry, but it was a bit of a politician's apology. It was, I'm sorry you were upset. And I think we've got a lot of uh, water to flow under this bridge yet in terms of his own conduct in this. But uh, we're all geniuses in hindsight. And I think we all need a well. bit of contrition and a bit of humility because the people who are upset by this still and are reliving this now mm. are, are deeply upset by this. I, I, I was at uh, Bannockburn Crematorium uh, a, a few years back and there was a special service for people who'd lost loved ones during COVID when we had the funeral restrictions, which still 
well, still breaks my heart. And, and there's there's a lot of water to flow under this bridge. Well, and, and, and as you know, many people difficult. thought the restrictions were very cruel. Um, again, maybe yes. perhaps with with hindsight. Let's pick up on this culture point because there's been so much mm -hmm. of it at uh, this inquiry and whether it did negatively affect the decision uh, making uh, that was made. It couldn't have helped, uh, let's put it that way. And also Lee Kane, one of the former advisers, said that Boris Johnson didn't have in his mind, the appropriate skill set needed for a pandemic. Pretty damning. Yes. I mean, we do have to remember, of course, that this was a fledgling administration that had been very good at campaigning and there were already quest questions marks when it came to Dominic Cummings being put in place in that special advisor role. People said it was chief of staff. He was actually known as a special advisor to Boris Johnson because he was a good campaigner, but not necessarily a good governor. On a more macro level with this COVID inquiry, I mean, is it an inquiry into Boris Johnson's premiership or is it an inquiry into what I think is the central question that needs to be answered, which is, was the cure worse than the disease? You know, on The Telegraph, we've already gone through the lockdown files. We've looked at the way in which government was governed by WhatsApp. We've also looked at the very, very narrow de decision making bodies, that COVID O and COVID A group that seem to completely run separately to actual full cabinet scrutiny. There's a massive question to be asked about the governance in general. However, equally on the paper, we did stories about people. I personally did a story about an old school friend who lost both of her parents to COVID mm. within months of each other. I similarly did stories on very young people who couldn't get seen for their cancer diagnoses and subsequently ended up dying because of COVID, not of COVID. So is this inquiry going to be answering any of these issues? Which restrictions worked, which didn't? What should we repeat in the future? What shouldn't we? There were question marks, um, questions asked by Michael Gove last week about the origin of the virus, which some inquiry at some point must mm. answer. The inquiry just batted it away, like that's not significant. Was it man-made? So some of I feel we're like scratching the service with this strange blame game of what did Dominic Cummings say about Matt Hancock? And, you know, on a wide well, level, that's not important. Well, it's talk, utterly, in fact, it's utterly trivial. Well, yeah. it, well it, it, except it does questions. point it does point to the culture that existed um, at the time. Let's just listen to Boris Johnson answering uh, questions around that. I think overwhelmingly that I did have access to the correct and proper forms of, of advice. And if you ask upon whom I relied uh, for for that advice. Uh, it was uh, the CMO and the CSA, uh, together with uh, the experts, the, uh, the officials in my private office. You lost confidence in your cabinet secretary in May 2020, did you not? Well, he asked to step aside. Did you lose confidence in your cabinet secretary in May 2020? Yeah, he asked to step aside. Did you lose confidence in your chief advisor, whom you described as engaging in an orgy of narcissism at the heart of your administration? Well, I think he also uh, stepped aside. Did you lose confidence in those senior advisers, Mr Johnson, and effectively dispose of them both? Well, uh, they, they both stepped aside from, uh, from government, but it was a very difficult, very challenging period. I mean, Simon Clark, is that good enough in terms of response from Boris Johnson? We're talking about key figures mm. at the heart of government. And you just heard the former prime minister say, well, they stepped aside. They stepped aside. How could this not have impacted what was going on? And what does it say about Boris Johnson's leadership? Well, I actually, I mean, in the meetings that I was in, I always saw uh, a, a, a proper government functioning structure. That is to say that the civil service and the medical experts presented their advice and ministers decided. And obviously, it must be remembered, and the Prime Minister has accepted, he was fully responsible ultimately for the decisions that were taken, that whilst the scientists had a duty to present their advice, that had to be balanced against the wider societal and economic and, wider, and other consequences of the decisions that were being uh, made, some of which were almost impossible by their nature to make. On, on, on Dominic Cummings, he is clearly a very gifted man, and, you know, for all his... Mm. Uh, faults as well as his uh, his brilliance. Uh, in the end, the Prime Minister needs to have people around him who are loyal right. and who are capable of uh, looking after the national interest and not, frankly, their own interest. Right. I think what we've seen in this inquiry, and it goes to Camilla's point, which I think is exactly the right one, is a score-settling exercise on an epic level by a number of people who mm. are determined to retrospectively wreck 
Boris Johnson's reputation, which is in many ways beside the point now. He has left office. He has. The, the point is surely that this inquiry should extract what we as a country, and indeed the wider uh, West, needs to take away from this episode. Because in the world we're now in, future pandemics are, if not probable, then certainly possible. And we need to know, I think, what are the, the right responses to those outbreaks when they occur. We clearly did not know ahead of time this time. What I don't think it needs to be, what I don't think it profits anyone, frankly, other than us in TV studios, really to well. relitigate, is who said what about who. You know, frankly, you know, the, the failings of some of these individuals are a matter of, uh, you know, of, I, of opinion. But now. the question should have been, will... should Boris Johnson have got rid of these people earlier? Should he have made yeah. different decisions? That might have impacted what went on. Was it just about score they, settling? They, they didn't just rock up out of nowhere, Simon. No. They were put into those positions of leadership. And that, that's why it's sort of both, actually, in this, because the point is who we elect will have to likely deal with a world where there are going to be not just pandemics, wars, sudden events... Yeah. And actually, it does matter who you put into positions of leadership because it does come from mm -hmm. the top. You set the culture. So if you set a culture where you bring in someone like Dominic Cummings, and what we're seeing from this, it wasn't just Dominic Cummings. There were lots of them all standing around, as I say, arguing about who was top dog and, and doing things that we can't use the phrase for at this time of day on television. You know, it, it matters, it matters not because... to the it, extent that the inquiry is investigating. For instance, it, Dominic uh, Cummings is saying that, you know, we should have locked down earlier. There's just been suggestion that mm. the Prime Minister, you know, was asleep at the wheel in February. And yet, at the same time, he didn't brief the Prime Minister that he should have locked down earlier. Mm. Well, but, can, well, another well, question I'd like so to ask of Dominic Cummings, as opposed to the nice. personality I point... That to you is, you know, why was there such reliance on modelling that turned out to be wrong? Well, let me just why pause there. Why some aspects let, of the scientific community let me just frozen about, out of number 10? how Can we, we make decisions yeah. and who makes right, decisions. Right, but Stella, how much uh, store should have been set in the way that Boris Johnson said on the chief medical officer and the chief scientific advisor, Chris Whitty and Patrick Valance? Um, there is a sense that they too um, were struggling at times uh, to advise in the best way in terms of protecting the public and ensuring that they did follow the rules. But we have also heard, as you know, from Patrick Vallance saying that Boris Johnson himself didn't really have a good grasp of the science. But you do see the tension between the different sets of advisers Absolutely. who were trying to guide Boris Johnson, who may ultimately have been the wrong person for the job at this time, trying to guide him as to what the decision should be. But I think that's what we mean by the culture, because actually, if you... I mean, the point of a chief medical officer is they are there to be the leading medical officer advising. So if that doesn't work as a format because you need to stress test their ideas, you need a culture in which you can do that, not a culture in which it's like, well, who's going to get the blame if this goes wrong? Again, that does come from the top. I mean, I was horrified because you can also just see how out of touch the way in which government operates is by some of the commentary from some of those people. So complaining about people having their children on record, for example, in the, in the meetings while, over Zoom because nobody had thought about, well, have we got diverse voices in this room? Who are we listening to? What are we doing to make sure that our decision making reflects all those people who are going to be impacted by it? There's clearly a lot to learn about the structures of governance, but also why that culture matters. Right. And why, if you elect people who treat it as a bit of a joke, oh. very serious things happen and very serious consequences arise as a result. Simon, briefly, and then yeah, we'll I listen mean, that, to a bit was, more. I mean, I can... I can sincerely say that was not the culture. The gravity of the situation was, you know, obvious to all of us. And in those meetings, the tension and the strain was self-evident. They were asking you know, about putting hair dry the, dryers up each other's noses. No, no, I'm afraid, look, the, the, the truth is that it was incredibly difficult. I think, Boris, on both getting the vaccine ready, on, on the broad timing of the lockdowns, which was maybe out by a few days, but, you know, also, as I've said at, at the start of the programme, was in some cases to resist lockdown, and rightly, or to lift lockdown, mm. and rightly, when both the scientists and Starmer were saying it should be left in place for longer, and, and, and were saying that lifting it, as we saw in the summer of 22, would be a disaster, and it wasn't. These decisions have to be seen in the context they were taken, which was it was frantically difficult to get them all right. Uh, uh, and, it, and, it, and, and the scientists do not have a monopoly 
on wisdom because they got some things wrong. Right. I mean, again, Alan, you will know uh, with the SNP government how hard these decisions were to make. Do you agree broadly that Boris Johnson <coughs> did make the, the right call when it came to vaccines and the vaccine rollout and the timing of lockdowns? Uh, I would, and the Scottish Government cooperated with uh, a lot of this stuff, and it, it's legitimate to interrogate how decisions were made and what the organisation was, and that's part of this, but Camilla's absolutely right. Different governments around the world dealt with this very differently, and phrases like we need to trust the science, the science was debatable and the science evolved really fast. Mm. So I hope the, commi the Committee of Inquiry is going to get into how other countries dealt with the science, what sort of experience we have from that, and there is a structural issue of governance mm. in this. So there's the organisational culture and Boris Johnson is responsible for that and it's legitimate that we, we, we talk about that fully but there's a wider question about what lessons do we need to learn about, who makes decisions on our behalf and what values are they operating to. Well talking about other countries and their experiences during the Covid pandemic, quite early on uh, Boris Johnson is asked whether he agrees broadly um, that the most important measure of how the government performed is around the number of people who died uh, during the pandemic here in the UK and elsewhere. Let's have a listen. But do you accept that overall the government decision making, not the pandemic, but the government decision making in response, led materially to there being a greater number of excess deaths in the United Kingdom than might otherwise have been the case? Uh, I I can't give you the answer to that question. Uh, I'm not sure. I noticed the, um, that in your opening preamble a few months ago, you produced a slide saying that the UK was, I think, second only to, to Italy for excess deaths. Correct. Uh, that's not, to the best of my knowledge, the, the case. Um, and I think that many other, all I would say is that man, many other countries suffered terrible losses from COVID. They did. And the, the, the evidence that I've seen suggests that we were well down the, the European table and, and well down the, uh, the world table. Though that is, of course, no comfort to uh, the bereaved and their, and their families. I, that, that seems to be the statistical reality. The evidence before Milady is that the United Kingdom had one of the highest rates of excess death in Europe. Almost all other Western European countries had a lower level of excess death. I've seen. Italy was tragically um, in a worse position than the United Kingdom. Well, I, I, don't wish, I don't wish to, to contradict you, Mr. Keith, but the, the evidence, the, the, uh, the ONS data I saw put us, I think, about 16th or, or 19th in a table of 33. In Western Europe, we were one of the worst off, if not the second worst off. You must have long reflected since that time why that was so. Why do you think that we had the rate of excess deaths in this country that we did ultimately have? As I say, I think that the statistics vary, and I think that the, um, every country struggled with a new pandemic. Um, and I think the, the UK, from the evidence that I have seen, was well down the European table and obviously even further down the, the, the world table. An important exchange. What did you make of that, Simon? Well, I think what Boris said there is right. Certainly, I, I, well, I think the initial estimates uh, were that the UK had scored very badly, but subsequent revisions have actually shown that it's because of the very accuracy of our data collection early that, if you like, we were penalised by appearing to perform much worse relative to our peers than we did. Uh, certainly, of the large European countries, I think we, broadly speaking, were in the middle, the middle of the outcome range. And I think Germany probably did score a bit better than than many did. I mean, this is obviously not a competition. I mean, well, it's ghastly to make it so. But, mm. you know, for the purposes of answering this question, I don't think we are an outlier now if you look at the subsequent data that's come in. Do you accept that? Who do you think is right on this? Uh, yes, it's not a competition, but it is an no. important measure of how the UK performed. What I'm more concerned about is if the, Prime Minister, the former Prime Minister is going to sit in an inquiry and challenge the data that the inquiry is basing its work well, on. If it's wrong, Stella, he's allowed well, to. Well, except that the inquiry are pretty clear that their data well, is, is more substantial. But that's not that the ONS data. One, well, but, I mean, so you're saying the inquiry... I, I am saying the inquiry got it wrong, yes. So, yes. So, Unequivocally, so an independent yes. inquiry 
which has spent months doing a lot of the preparation well, for yeah, this, yeah. do you think knows doesn't know as much as the Prime Minister who's trying to say I, I, I'm it's saying not that, that issue? If you, if we could, we could, we could litigate well, this after the... After right, the but it but, doesn't bode well for committing, engaging in the process and the inquiry that you want people to... Well, make a well, defend well, 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 make make independent inquiry, but the manner of that questioning is very much of the vein of a preordained right. sort of prelude to this inquiry, which is we should have shut down earlier harder and for longer, because he's trying to make this point about what Britain did want wrong in comparison to other countries. You know, why, why isn't the inquiry looking at, for instance, another really important issue when it came to lockdown? The average age, I understand, of deaths during COVID, of COVID, was 82. How did uh, lockdowns, for instance, disproportionately affect poorer people who had to go out to work, who had to go onto the trains while middle-class people stayed at home and worked from home. Yeah. When are we going to get the assessment of that? When are we going to get the assessment? And bear in mind this inquiry until the Telegraph lobbied for it with other children's <laughs> group weren't even going to look at the impact on children of shutting schools mm -hmm. and the long-term impact on their mental health and well-being. So what is the inquiry? What is well, the point of this inquiry we, if it's we, not... Well, hang on. Well, if, if, you, if, we, if we... You can't say we need to look at what we did differently differently to other countries and then say, oh, well, one of the things I, they well, want to look let at... Let me ask... Let me saying that, lockdowns. Stella. I'm saying that the, the inquiry mean, seems to be... Keith's questioning there was really plain. I saw it. Yeah, Did yeah. you see it, Alan? It was basically saying, you know, the, the premise of my questioning is going to be on the basis that lockdown was not only right, but that we should have done more of it. Well, and do you I'd agree like with that? Is that, is that is well, that hang on, hang on, more hang on. Let me just make a suggestion, because we looked at the figures after we heard uh, that exchange, and I suggest that they were talking about two slightly different things in terms of comparing numbers. Um, because Hugo Keith is suggesting, rightly, uh, that the United Kingdom fared very badly in terms of the uh, death rate and excess deaths. Um, with other Western European countries. But you are right, and Boris Johnson is also right, that when you take all European countries, then the UK comes out about mid-level. Are these comparisons helpful? I think they are, but I think in, in many ways we need to depoliticise this, and, and, and people are going to see in this inquiry what they want to see. And, and I, I think there's a wider issue about the decisions that were made, how they came to be made, and the impacts of them. Now, it's a matter of record the Scottish Government wanted to lock down earlier than the mm. UK Government. But, did. of course, it's also a matter of record that Scotland's death rate increase is not very far behind England's. England's was 3.2%. These are the official figures. And Scotland's was 3%. So do you accept that the death rate was high in Scotland too, despite the fact that you might have made slightly different decisions? Of course it was. And, and that's where the policies were brought the same because mm. there was a lot of complementarity across the UK nations quite rightly because we've got a lot of people who were moving around between our borders but there's a wider comparison here that needs to really be where we take the lessons from about how different countries dealt with this. Sweden dealt with it in a mm. very different way to the UK. Belgium measured its statistics in a different way to how the UK does and if we're comparing oranges with apples we're going to get the wrong, the wrong answer. So we'll need to interrogate all this data properly and this is mm. where I hope we get past the sideshow frankly, of the, the, the culture within Downing Street. And it's legitimate to, to, to question that, and it looks pretty grim, I have to say. Mm. But we need to get on to what the decisions actually were and what their impact actually was. And nobody has the monopoly on wisdom, especially in hindsight on it. No, um, uh, we'll continue to have people watching uh, the evidence from Boris Johnson, the former Prime Minister. But let's talk uh, about Rwanda, because the Home Secretary has returned, James <coughs> Cleverley, from the country after signing a new treaty there, which he says will address the Supreme Court's concerns after their ruling uh, dismissing the scheme to send asylum seekers who arrive here to Rwanda to have their claims processed in order for them to stay there. Let's have a look at some of the headlines. Uh, the Daily Telegraph, ministers threatened to quit over Rwanda flights law. Um, the Telegraph saying centre-left MPs are threatening uh, to quit over this. The Guardian saying the Tory right in threat to Sunak on Rwanda. Um, and then this finally uh, from The Times, Sunak's middle way on Rwanda. Well, you can tell uh, the flavour of those headlines that this 
is a difficult policy for Rishi Sunak to get past his party. Simon, you are one of those, um, I think I'm right in saying, mm. who would like to see the accompanying legislation that we are expecting this week um, say that uh, the UK should leave the European Convention on Human Rights in order to allow the UK to push ahead with this Rwanda scheme and not experience legal challenges. Is that right? Well, not to leave the European Convention, but to disapply it for the purposes right. of this legislation. I think the, the point is that we have to do what works because we need to stop these small boat crossings and there is no solution here which is going to deliver that until you change the incentives which are driving this trade. And that means making sure that if you come to the UK, you don't get to, uh, illegally, you don't get to stay here and you go to a safe third country. Parliament has made its views known. The government has rightly secured the new treaty with Rwanda this week. That is a good thing. It further strengthens and answers the, uh, the, the Supreme Court's challenge on this issue. It, but it is the case mm. that we have repeatedly seen the courts strike this policy down and the grounds for that keep shifting. So in the first instance, it was the human rights arrangements in right. Rwanda. Mm. Uh, at the Supreme Court level, it was the refoulement issue. I think it is absolutely imperative, and, and the Prime Minister rightly accepts this, that these flights leave and that this policy is enacted. And if we are to do that, experience suggests to me that we do need to disapply our human rights arrangements. Right. I mean, you've tweeted this. Failure to stop the boats would be a red line for a number of Conservatives, namely our voters. Yes. A red line. What do you mean by well, a red that line? That was in reference to uh, the One Nation group last night saying that uh, changes to our human rights legislation will be a red line for them. I was making the point that yeah. their uh, sensibilities on this question need to be contextualised against the raw anger that I see on the doorsteps in my constituency that we are, as a nation, unable to police our borders. We have to end what is a horrendous or, situation or, where or people, what, traffickers... I mean, you seem to be building to a threat to well, Rishi Sunak. No, are you sending a letter I, of no well, confidence? Saying, are you saying I, what, what well, happens if, if the government does not do as you have suggested? That, well, I, I have made it clear that this, for me, is a, is a confidence issue in the Prime Minister because it's certainly a confidence issue for my voters in me. But the wider point is it's a confidence issue about whether Britain can, in fact, police her borders and govern herself according to the standards which any sensible... Uh, person would expect. Right. I am a great believer in human rights. I, I, I believe that the, a British Bill of Rights would be an appropriate structure within which to contain them. Well, it cannot be the case, and this is a final point because I, I know others need to Yes. Be. It cannot be the case that a human rights framework was set up in the late 40s which could never have envisaged a world in which tens of thousands of people were coming to this country illegally and we were unable to deport them right. is regarded right. as so sacrosanct well, let... that we can't change it. Well, just before I bring in um, Stella uh, and the others, if there aren't notwithstanding clauses, as they are called, so that uh, the government can disapply uh, parts of the European Convention on Human Rights, will you put in a confidence letter? Well, the uh, various groupings of my colleagues, of whom I'm one, uh, have, have said that we will uh, scrutinise this legislation properly to see whether it works. Yeah, there will be a decision made by a committee of experts and they will assess whether in their view... And if the experts say it doesn't been, work? Well, I think at that point then there will be very f serious conversations to be had about the passage, of that the passage of that legislation. But look, I reserve all options here because right. it's very clear that we have to sort this. Stella? This is just time-wasting. We've had more Home Secretaries going to Rwanda than actual people who might be affected by this policy, and frankly, rightly so. Simon, those treaties were written when there were thousands of people around the world fleeing persecution. That's why they were written. That's what these people are doing. And if you actually put not, the money that you are stuff. wasting, you don't know that. They and when, so Simon, they I well, listen to you, all right? I listen to you, mm. and it's an uncomfortable truth for all of you that when the people in the boats actually have their asylum claims processed, they turn out to be genuine refugees because your government has failed to provide safe routes. For example, there is no safe route from Iran at the moment, but many of your colleagues will get up and decry persecution in Iran. So rather than wasting money and wasting effort on something that's clearly just an election, you're just running down the clock to the election on this so that you can say, well, we would stop the boats this way. You want to stop the boats, go after the traffickers. Many of us have been trying to persuade are. you. No, you're not. There's yeah, nothing in your legislation. Simon, so I, I listened to you. Well, the uncomfortable truth is there is nothing in your legislation that actually 
tackles the traffickers. Right, well, let me answer that problems. question. I mean, is there anything there? Well, there is a, a whole range of activity which the Home Office is conducting, including interventions which were made in Bulgaria in recent weeks to, tr to crack down on the dinghies, the actual supply of the boats, which is driving this trade. But the reality is, and this, to Stella's point, if people are seeking uh, uh, asylum from Iran, they, they should be taking asylum in the first safe country How? which they come to, and that is not the United Kingdom and Great Britain. Right, I'm just going to pause you just for one moment, just to remind our viewers that in five minutes' time we will, of course, have Prime Minister's questions with Rishi Sunak and Keir Starmer. We will also bring you any developments from the COVID inquiry. Returning to this issue, Alan, do you accept what has uh, been established by the courts, that the principle of the UK and the UK government sending asylum seekers to a third country is lawful? In itself, yes, but there's all sorts of questions about the, the efficacy of how that would work. And, and uh, let's not be distracted by the sideshow here. The Rwanda policy is, a, is an absurd policy that won't work. Other European countries have flirted with this idea over the years. Denmark went fairly far down the yes, line and, and realised it wouldn't work because it won't work. If you want to stop the boats, properly fund the Home Office to deal with asylum processes, create safe and legal routes. There's plenty of ways of fixing this that will actually fix it as opposed to get tied up with this grotesque sideshow which is silly legislation and otherwise sensible people talking about disapplying the Convention of Human Rights. Every other European country manages to operate within it. Lots of other countries are dealing with migration as well. You say it won't work. Do you have a moral objection to the idea of sending asylum seekers to a third country? I do, but mm. also a practical one, because it's expensive, it won't work. There's been a, a lot of money spent on a policy that isn't actually going to tackle the core problem, which is we need safe and legal routes and we need properly funded asylum processing is it Is it looking more like a gimmick, a grotesque sideshow, to quote Alan? It hasn't worked thus far in terms of a deterrent. What has seemed to work, if we take what the government says at face value, is an agreement with Albania, more money going to the French to patrol that border. It won't work and it hasn't worked. Well, it doesn't look like it's going to work. I mean, obviously, this uh, new legislation is to tell the Supreme Court that Rwanda is safe when they consider it not to be. I mean, one might question whether Rwanda was the right country to begin with. Having said that, I think from the electorate's perspective, and I would say this on for people on both sides of the uh, electoral divide, so to speak, you know, Labour voters, Tory voters, Lib Dems, they are concerned not just about illegal migration, but legal migration, not mm. least with that record 745,000 figure to the end of December. And also, I think they're probably quite justified in wanting domestic law to take primacy, not least because they elect the people who come up with the laws in this country <laughs> and not those who don't it and who seek to overrule law. them. I'm going to, I'm going to... One of the other uncomfortable truths about all of this. I'm going to pause you. I'm going to pause you again because I want to play you a little bit more of Boris Johnson's evidence before we go to Prime Minister's questions. And this is the former Prime Minister talking about the early days of the pandemic, or perhaps even before it had become clear that there was a pandemic. Let's have a listen. It would certainly be fair to say of the, uh, of me, the entire Whitehall establishment, scientific uh, community included, our, our, our advisors included, that we underestimated the scale and the pace of the, of the challenge. This and 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 you you can see that very clearly in those early days in uh, in March from late February through to the the sequence of of NPIs of lockdowns. You, you can see that we A were all failure. we were all collectively uh, underestimating how fast it had already spread in the UK. Uh, we underestimated, we, we, we put the, the peak too, too late, the first peak too late. We thought it would be in you know, May, June. That was totally wrong. Um, I don't blame the, the scientists for, for that at all, but that was, that was, the, that was the feeling. Um, so, I mean, candid um, from mm. Boris Johnson, but also saying collectively we underestimated the pace and the scale uh, of the pandemic. Can you understand that? I think we can look at the data now and see that clearly it probably should have been a much earlier lockdown. But we can also hear talk about comments about piling bodies high and, well, you know, old people have had a good life and wonder mm. about the culture, whether people were taking seriously enough 
the risk of a pandemic because other countries did take it more seriously earlier on and did act quicker than we did. And that's the sort of thing that the inquiry should be getting to. Because Camilla is right, we do need to look at why disproportionately mm. certain groups were affected by that decision, particularly women from ethnic minority backgrounds who were older. Those are exactly the sort of people who were just dismissed by those sorts of commentaries. And what you worry about when you hear that is, well, are you trying to say we should have taken it more seriously, mm. in which case oh. that is a welcome admission, or do you recognise the culture in which you dismiss these problems because at the time they wanted to talk about Brexit no. was devastating no. to people? No. Simon, I might have to interrupt if we go into yeah. Prime Minister's questions. I mean, we, we, Brexit was already resolved by the time this, this was done, but the, the point is it was not the case resolved. that other... Uh, countries were locking down ahead of us in, in, in Western Europe at that point. We basically moved as part of the Western European herd on this. But it's question. interesting that he now admits, uh, Boris Johnson, that, that they did underestimate Yes, we did. The scale I mean, I, but, yeah. but, but on the basis of the advice, which was that the peak was going to come later and you mm. couldn't ask people to lock down for weeks or months ahead of that coming, you have to contextualise th this. And that's what Boris is rightly saying, that ultimately the advice was very different to that which subsequently... Uh, turned out to be the case. This was a virus that ripped through societies like wildfire, but we couldn't have asked people to lock down in their houses for weeks or months preemptively ahead of a peak which might have been expected to come much later. I mean, one of the key decisions was about discharging, as you know, yes, patients to, um, to care homes. Yeah. Um, and Boris Johnson has asked about that. Matt Hancock has obviously yeah. uh, been asked about that extensively. I mean, those decisions were deemed critical um, then and now. Yeah. Um, what do you make of what the response well, has been? I wrote been? extensively about it at the time because mm. my father runs a care home. You know, that we threw a protective ring mm, mm. was complete nonsense from Hancock. And the idea, the stupidity, of releasing people from hospital into care homes without testing. I mean, my father defied the order and managed to keep that home COVID-free for the first year. But at the same time, that was, uh, frankly, sheer lunacy. Um, but, uh, but equally, people seem to have forgotten some of the early press conferences from Witty and Valance where they were talking about herd immunity, where they're well. talking about not needing to lock down. So the idea that the science was straight on this from the very beginning, along with the politics, mm. is frankly for the birds. Go look go look back at the early mm. press conferences. I mean, Alan, what do you mean? I mean, yes, herd immunity, that phrase that we heard and then disappeared from the lexicon of, uh, of the COVID inquiry. And the response, again, in care homes, uh, releasing people, that, that was so difficult and caused so much pain for so many families. Yes. I'm glad to see Boris Johnson admitting that it evolved really fast and I think we all need to accept that. Remember the first lockdown was only been a couple of weeks. We were all expecting it just to be, we'll be back in a couple of fortnight oh, or yeah, so. Yeah, yeah. And then it changed. And all of us need to slightly put the badges to one side and mm -hmm. get to the, the root of, well, how was the decision made and what was the consequences of it? And have a bit of good, good faith and goodwill to try and get to the bottom of the lessons we need to learn. And I, I don't want to see too much of a blame game on this, the next couple of days, which I, I suspect we're going to see plenty of it. Right. We're going to go into the chamber um, in a moment's time. It is the Deputy Speaker, Eleanor Lang, who is in the chair uh, for today's uh, Prime Minister's questions. But just briefly, because she's obviously going through some notices, or perhaps we can go into the chamber. Here's Prime Minister's questions. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Question number one. Oh, Madam Deputy Speaker, can I welcome you to your place and I know the whole House will wish the Speaker a speedy recovery. And before I answer my honourable friend's question, I know the whole House will also want to join me in offering our condolences to the family and friends of Alistair Darling, Glenys Kinnock and Lord James Douglas Hamilton. They made each an enormous contribution to public life and will be deeply missed. Madam Deputy Speaker, the Hillsborough families have suffered multiple injustices. The loss of 97 lives the blaming of the fans and the in unforgivable institutional defensiveness by public bodies. I am profoundly sorry for what they have been through. Today, the government has published its response to Bishop James Jones's report to ensure the pain and the suffering of the Hillsborough families is not repeated. I'm immensely grateful they have shared their experiences. I hope to meet them in the new year and the Justice Secretary will making an oral statement after PMQs. Turning to my honourable friend's question, the government is continuing to work closely with the Mayor of the West Midlands to fully develop his plans to deliver growth. Sir Michael Fabricant. Well, firstly, may I join the Prime Minister in his comments about the Hillsborough families. It's thanks to Margaret Thatcher yeah, yeah. Yeah. and her robust treatment of militant trade unions in the West Midlands 
her contribution of £10 billion at today's prices to the motor industry in the West Midlands that iconic names like Jaguar and Land Rover still exist. So does the Prime Minister share my boundless joy that on the road to Damascus, <laughs> and in recognition of her great heritage and all that she achieved, another, another fanboy, another fanboy has joined her great belief. Madam Deputy Speaker, the Right Honourable Gentleman is a fantastic uh, champion of his area. And because of the pro business policies of this government, I'm delighted to see the billions of pounds of investment by JLR in their move towards electrification in the region. But he is absolutely right. I am always happy to welcome new Thatcherites from all sides of this House. But it, it, does, it, does, it, does, it does say something about the Leader of the Opposition that the main female strong leader that he could praise is Margaret Thatcher and not his own fantastic deputy. Since, since question one was a closed question, we now go to question two, Sarah Champion. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Question number two. Madam Deputy Speaker, this morning I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others. In addition to my duties in this House, I shall have further such meetings later today. Sir Champion. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. The Government is set to close the Household Support Scheme in March, cutting off crucial free meals for 12,000 Rotherham's children in the lowest income families. With the government's cost of living crisis in full swing and energy prices about to increase again, how does the Prime Minister justify taking food from the mouths of my poorest children? Yeah. Yeah. Well, Madam, Madam Deputy Speaker, what we are doing is ensuring that no child should grow up in poverty. And that's why not only this year we've provided considerable cost of living support worth over £3,000 to a typical household, more support this winter for pensioners, a record increase in the national living wage and a full indexation and uplifting of welfare for the next financial year. But when it comes to children and food, Madam Deputy Speaker, not only uh, do we fund the free school meals for almost two million children, we also introduce the holiday activity and food programme, which provides not just food but enriching activities to deprive children up and down the entire country, including in her local authority. If there is one place where everyone should feel safe, it's in their own home. But the reality is that for some of the most vulnerable people, home is precisely where they can be most at risk. Terrorised by criminals who target them, move in, take control and set up a base camp from where they sell drugs or facilitate prostitution in a horrendous form of exploitation known as cuckooing. It has happened in Eastbourne, and it is happening across the country. It is not an offence, but it should be, and wasn't cited in the Criminal Justice Bill debated last week. So can I ask my right honourable friend and the Home Secretary if uh, they would meet with me and concerned colleagues to further discuss the issue? Yeah. Yeah. Right. I agree with my honourable friend that cooking is an abhorrent practice that does often prey on the most vulnerable in society. As part of the government's antisocial behaviour action plan, the Home Office engaged with relevant stakeholders about whether a new criminal offence was necessary. The results of that engagement demonstrated that there are a range of existing powers that can be used to disrupt this activity, but of course I'll ensure that the relevant minister meets with her and updates on the work we are doing to share effective practice to tackle this abhorrent problem. Leader of the Opposition, Sir Keir Starmer. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker, and it's very good to see you in your place, and we wish the Speaker a speedy recovery. Uh, this week we lost two giants of the Labour family, and I thank the Prime Minister for his comments. Alistair Darling was a man of unassuming intelligence, warmth and kindness. He brought a calm expertise and, in private, a cutting wit, and devoted 
his love of his family was ever present. Our thoughts are with Maggie, his wife, Callum, Anna, who he loved so dearly. Yeah. Glenis Kinnock was a passionate campaigner for social justice who changed lives home and abroad. She was a loving and supportive partner and mother, and her death is a huge loss to all of us. We are thinking of Neil, of Stephen, Rachel, and of all the family. Yeah. Can I also echo the Prime Minister's comments in relation to Lord Douglas Hamilton? And in relation to the Hillsborough families, they deserve justice. Yeah. In a previous capacity, I worked with the families. They waited a very, very long time for the findings, thanks to people in this house, um, and they've waited a long time for this response, but I'm glad it is now coming. Madam Deputy Speaker, if the purpose of the Rwanda gimmick was to solve a political headache of the Tories' own making, to get people out of the country who they simply couldn't deal with, then it's been a resounding success. After all, they've managed to send three Home Secretaries there, an achievement for which the whole country can be grateful. So, apart from members of his own Cabinet, how many people has the Prime Minister sent to Rwanda? Well, Madam Deputy Speaker, as I've been clear before, we will do everything it takes. Mr Speaker, we will do everything it takes to get this scheme working so that we can indeed stop the boats. And that's why this week we have signed a new legally binding treaty with Rwanda, which together with new legislation will address all the concerns that have been raised, because everyone should be in no doubt about our absolute commitment to stop the boats and get flights off. Because, Madam Deputy Speaker, and this is the crucial point that the Honourable Gentleman doesn't understand, deterrence is critical. Even the National Crime Agency have said that you need an effective removals and deterrence agreement if you truly want to break the cycle of tragedy that we see. But what we heard this morning from his own ministers was that, was that they would scrap the scheme even when it is operational and working. As again, once again, Mr Speaker, once again, instead of being on the side of the British people, he finds himself on the side of the people smugglers. Madam Deputy Speaker, when they first announced this gimmick, they claimed Rwanda would settle tens of thousands of people. Tens of thousands of people. <laughs> then the Deputy Former Prime Minister quickly whittled it down to mere hundreds. Yeah. Then the Court of Appeal in June made clear there's housing for just 100. The current number of people sent there remains stubbornly consistent. Zero. Yeah. <laughs> at, the same, at the same time, at the same time, Madam Deputy, Article 19 of the treaty says the parties shall make arrangements for the United Kingdom to resettle a portion of Rwanda's most vulnerable refugees in the United Kingdom. So, how many refugees from Rwanda will be coming here to the UK under the treaty? <laughs> Mr. Speaker, what? Madam Deputy Speaker, sorry. Mad Order! Prime Minister. That addresses all the concerns of the Supreme Court. But I, it's, it's a point of pride, Madam Deputy Speaker, that we are a compassionate country that does welcome people from around the world. But, but let's just, let me just get the Honourable Gentleman up to speed on what we are doing. Reduce the number of illegal arrivals from Albania by 90%. Increase the number of illegal working raids by 50%. Because of all the action, we've taken the number of small boat arrivals down by a third, Madam Deputy Speaker. But what is the Honourable Gentleman's plan? Because it comes down to he just simply doesn't have a plan to address this problem. On a, but no, no, I'm probably being unfair because he does have a plan. It's to cook up a deal with the EU that would see us accept 100,000 illegal migrants. Migration's trebled on his watch, and all he can do is make up numbers about the Labour Party. It's really pitiful. I'm not actually sure the Prime Minister can have read this thing. Article 4 says the scheme is capped at Rwanda's capacity. That's 100. Article 5 says Rwanda can turn them away if they want. Article 19 says we actually have to take refugees from Rwanda. How much did this fantastic deal cost us? Prime Minister. Uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, as the Home Secretary was crystal clear about, 
There is no incremental money. There is no incremental money that has been provided. This is about is ensuring that the concerns of the Supreme Court have all been addressed in a legally binding treaty that will allow us to operationalise the scheme. But I'm glad he raised the topic of legal migration, which I agree is absolutely far too high, Madam Deputy Speaker. That's why this week we've outlined a plan bigger than any other government before to reduce the levels of legal migration by £300. It's an incredibly comprehensive plan. So if he cares so much about it, the simple question for him is, does he support the plan? Madam Deputy Speaker, he clearly hasn't read it. Annex A, Annex A says, on top, on top of the 140 million he's already showered on Rwanda, when we send people there under this treaty, we have to pay for their accommodation and their upkeep for five years. And that's not all. This morning, a government minister admitted that anyone we send to Rwanda who commits a crime can be returned to us. I'm beginning to see why the Home Secretary says Rwanda scheme has something to do with bats, I think, wasn't it? <laughs> what, does, what does he first think attracted Mr Kagame to hundreds of millions of pounds for nothing in return? I have slightly lost the thread of the question, Madam Deputy Speaker, but the, the simple point is, the simple point, the, the simple point is, there is a simple question here. If you believe in stopping the boats, as we on this side of the House do, you need to have an effective deterrence and returns agreement. It's as simple as that. The Honourable Gentleman is not interested in stopping the boats, which is why he's not interested in the Rwanda plan. In fact, Madam Deputy Speaker, in fact, we know that they don't want to tackle this issue, because even when, even when this government was trying to deport foreign national offenders out of this country, they opposed it. Multiple members of his shadow front bench all signed a letter to me to that effect. But I don't need to tell him that, because he signed it too. OK, that's, that's enough. <laughs> Sir Keir Starmer. Madam Deputy Speaker, I would say that this treaty has got more holes in than the Swiss cheese, but I don't want to wind up the Prime Minister <laughs> by talking about a European country again. <laughs> Madam Deputy Speaker, you have to give credit to the Rwandan government. Yep. They saw this Prime Minister coming a mile off. <laughs> you can only imagine their delight, their sheer disbelief when having already banked £140 million of British taxpayer money without housing a single asylum seeker, the Prime Minister appears again with another offer they can't refuse, a gimmick that will send taxpayers' money to Rwanda, refugees from Rwanda to Britain, and won't stop the boats. It was mentioned of Margaret Thatcher earlier. How... Madam Deputy Speaker... There's understandable excitement about the mention of the name, but the House must listen to the Leader of the Opposition, Sir Keir Starmer. Party go from up yours to laws to take our money, Kigami. Mr Speaker... I do. Well, Ma Madam Deputy Speaker, I, 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 when, it comes, when it comes to this European thing and Margaret Thatcher, this is, this is the week that the Shadow Foreign Secretary, I think, didn't rule out rejoining the European Union. And that, he can role play Margaret Thatcher all he wants, but when it comes to Europe, his answer is the same yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Madam Deputy Speaker. For, forget the private jet. He's, he's obviously on a private planet of his own. <laughs> but as we Daily Mail readers learned this week that the Prime Minister has begun to feel sorry for himself. Yeah. He's even been heard comparing his plight to his beloved Southampton Football Club. Oh. I do think that's a bit harsh because Saints have been on an 11-game unbeaten run, <laughs> while, as the song has it, the Prime Minister gets battered everywhere he goes. <laughs> But if you want the perfect example of how badly the Tories have broken the asylum system, last week, 
the Home Office admitted that 17,000 people in the asylum system. Order! Order! Come on! Uh, Sir Keir Starmer. Thank you. If you want the perfect example of how badly they've broken the asylum system, Madam Deputy Speaker, last week the Home Office admitted that 17,000 people in the asylum system have disappeared. Their exact words, it's hard to believe this, we don't think we know where all these people are. Now, you might lose your car keys, you might lose your headphones, you might lose your marbles. How do you lose 17,000 people? Well, Madam Deputy Speaker, I, I mean, on, on the topic of football teams, he, lost, do, he used to describe Ru, this Rwanda policy as immoral, and yet his football team has a Visit Rwanda badge on the side of them. But I like, in, the week, in, the week, in, in the week when he made his big economy speech, we're still waiting to hear how he's going to borrow £28 billion pounds and still cut taxes and reduce debt. It's the same old thing. The sums don't add up. But while they're struggling with their calculator, we're getting on and delivering a new treaty with Rwanda, the toughest measures to cut legal migration, our schools marching up the tables and tax cuts for millions, Madam Deputy Speaker. So whether it's controlling our borders or lowering our taxes, just like the Saints, the Conservatives are marching on. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I'm getting fed up with sitting in traffic jams in my constituency caused by contractors digging up roads involving lane closures and temporary traffic lights, often invoking utility company emergency powers that turn out not to be emergencies, and often with no sign of anybody doing any work, particularly over weekends. So I set up a campaign to name and shame these inconsiderate contractors. But it turns out that when they cause all this chaos, when they breach the rules of their permit, the maximum penalty is an £80 fixed penalty notice. So will the Prime Minister back my campaign and support better enforcement and realistic levels of fines? Yes. Well, my honourable friend makes an excellent point, and that's why we've set aside £8 billion as a result of our plans on HS2, Madam Deputy Speaker, which is enough to resurface over 5,000 miles of road to improve journeys, a cornerstone of our plan. But also, we are introducing a range of measures, as the Honourable Gentleman says, to reduce congestion from roadworks. Contained in the plan for drivers is a scheme for greater fines and penalties to ensure that works do finish on time. And I'll make sure that we look at his suggestion, and I wholeheartedly back his campaign. Yeah. Leader of the Scottish Nationalists, Stephen Flynn. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Is the Prime Minister worried that he is projected to be the first Conservative Party leader to lose a general election to a fellow Thatcherite? Ah. We really must hear the Prime Minister, and we've got a lot of questions to get through. It's, it's not the Prime Minister's <laughs> opponents who are giving him trouble. Prime Minister! That's Prime Minister. Ma 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 Madam Deputy Speaker, I say to the Honourable Gentleman, Margaret Thatcher's view was cut inflation, then cut taxes, and then win an election, and that's very much my plan. Yeah. Of, of course, Madam Deputy Speaker, it's not just in relation to Margaret Thatcher where the so Tory and Labour leader appear to agree. The same is true of the government's latest migration policies. Now, for those of us on these benches, we aren't afraid to say that we believe migration is a good thing. Yeah. It, enriches, it enriches our communities, it enriches our economy, it enriches our universities, our schools, our health service and, of course, our care sector. So in that regard, can I ask the Prime Minister, why does he think it is acceptable to ask people to come to these shores to care for our family members whilst we show complete disregard for theirs? What has become of this place? Yeah. Well, Madam Speaker, it's completely wrong. No, as we've already said, we have a proud track record of welcoming those who are most vulnerable around the world. Over half a million over the past few years from Syria, Afghanistan, Ukraine, Hong Kong and elsewhere. And that's what this country will always do. But at the same time, 
When it comes to economic migration and other forms, it's absolutely right that we take strong action to curb the levels that we have seen because they are simply far too high and place unsustainable pressure on our public services. And, Madam Speaker, I make no apology for saying that or indeed saying that it is important that those who come here contribute to our public services. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Can I first of all welcome the Government's significant funding in increase for two-year-olds preschooling in 2023? But the illustrative 24-25 DfE funding to Dorset Council for two-year-olds preschooling is looking to be a net 17 pence per hour less than it is today, and it is giving West Dorset preschools some nervousness about their sustainability. Will my right hon. Friend the Prime Minister support me to ensure that educational funding formulas for this will be taking into account the challenges of rural living and allow excellent preschools to... We've got it. Prime Minister. Deputy Speaker, uh, in a couple of years' time, we'll have increased spending to over £8 billion every year on free hours and early education, which will help working families with childcare costs. Indeed, it's the single biggest investment in childcare in England ever. But my honourable friend makes an excellent point, and that's why we will ensure that there is a discretionary supplement in the local authorities' local funding formula for rural communities to account for the smaller economies of scale and ensure that they can continue to deliver their very vital work. Stephen Ferry. At nine months on from the Windsor Framework, I thank the Prime Minister for his ongoing efforts to restore the Northern Ireland Assembly and Executive. However, if and when the institutions are restored, they will still be plagued by the same structural weaknesses that have seen repeated collapses and unfairness around things like designations. This week, the Northern Ireland Affairs Committee published a report calling for a, a review of the Good Friday Agreement. Many architects of the agreement, such as uh, Tony Blair, John Major and Bertie Ahern, have recognised the case for reform. So can the Prime Minister commit to an early review of the agreement to improve its stability, effectiveness and fairness? Prime Minister. Yeah, so I recognise the Honourable Member's campaigning on this issue, and I've got great respect for his position. Indeed, we've spoken on a number of occasions, both here and on my visits to Northern Ireland. Uh, my focus right now is on getting the institutions up and running, and my overarching priority is to get public services back on track in Northern Ireland, which is, I know is an ambition that he and I share. Any reform of institutions are best dealt with with the support of all parts of the community. But when it comes to restoring the current institutions, the government is doing everything it can to support efforts, and I know the Secretary of State will be in touch and engagement with the parties imminently on that point. Dick Fletcher. Thank you, Madam Deputy yeah. Speaker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yesterday, 13 men died by suicide. Today, 88 men will die of heart disease. Tomorrow and every day, 90,000 men will wake up in prison. And we have 2.2 million boys living today at home with no dad. We thankfully have an excellent Cabinet Minister for Women. We have an excellent Minister for Women. So will the Prime Minister meet with me to discuss the merits of a Minister for Men and Boys? Because as Warren Farrell states, one one sex losers, both sex lose. Yay. Can I um, say to my honourable friend that he should be commended for his tireless campaigning? on this issue. Uh, he's particularly right to focus on suicide, and that's why I'm grateful for his engagement with the suicide prevention strategy, which sets out the actions that we will take to reduce suicides in the coming years. But it's also uh, a thanks partly into his campaigning that on International Men's Day, we announced that we are appointing the first men's health ambassador and launching a men's health task force. And I look forward to continued collaboration with him so that we can represent his concerns adequately. Simon Lightwood. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Convicted criminals are being held in police station cells across West Yorkshire because this government has completely failed to deliver more prison places. Yeah. Two thirds of prisons are overcrowded, criminals let out early, if sentenced at all, only 2% of rapists reaching court, serious violence up 60%, knife crime up by 70%, and nearly 65,000 cases waiting to be heard. So, Prime Minister, how can you reassure the residents of Wakefield that they are safe on our streets? Yeah. Well, Madam Deputy Speaker, we have a clear plan to protect victims, punish criminals and cut crime. We're investing £400 million more, in fact, in prison places, on top of the £4 billion that I announced as Chancellor, which is delivering 20,000 new cells. We're also making sure that rapists serve every day of their sentences and ensuring that life means life for the worst offenders, something that I hope that the Labour Party will be supporting soon. Sir Oliver Hills. 
My uh, constituents, Kerry and Francis Menai Davis, are in the public gallery today, and they lost their son after a long battle with cancer where they visited him in hospital every day. They've set up a charity called It's Never You to help parents uh, in that situation. And on Monday, I intend to uh, present a bill which would ask the government to report on what support can be given to parents in that situation. And I hope you might ask ministers to discuss this with me so that we can find a way forward to help parents in this dreadful situation. Yeah. Yeah. Well, can I express my sympathies to my royal friends? constituents for what they have been through and commend them uh, for setting up the It's Never You charity. I will ensure that the uh, organisers and he get the appropriate meeting with the Minister to discuss their important work. He's absolutely right. Parents that are in that situation should have all the support that they need and we'll make sure that that happens. Rebecca Long-Bailey. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. One in five of my residents live in fuel poverty and this winter looks to be the most brutal yet according to Cornwall Insights. With the current trajectory in energy prices expected to be the new norm for the rest of the decade. As the Prime Minister will know, one of the best ways to support households would be the introduction of a social tariff. He promised a consultation by summer this year. We're still waiting. When will the consultation be released? Madam Deputy Speaker, we've also provided considerable support in the here and now for households with their energy bills. £900 of direct cost of living support this financial year, on top of a record increase in benefits, along with winter fuel payments of up to £300 this winter for, po- for pensioners, because they're particularly vulnerable. And we will continue to look at all support uh, that we have to ensure that those who need it are getting the help that they deserve. Andrew Salou. Prop 28. Will the Prime Minister salute South West Bedfordshire's contribution to our nation's energy security for having had the tallest wind turbine in England, the largest battery in Europe, and now the most powerful wind turbine in England, which has local support? And can we also ensure that my constituents now get cheaper energy bills for hosting this vital infrastructure? Madam Deputy Speaker, uh, I can say uh, that we are looking exactly at how local communities can benefit when new infrastructure is uh, in their vicinity as part of our new plan for increased energy security. But also, can I commend his local area for the contribution they're making to our clean energy transition? It's a great example of this country's fantastic track record in delivering net zero and decarbonising faster than any other major economy. Not something that you'll hear from the party opposite, but something that we on this side of the House are very proud of. Madam Deputy Speaker, the Government failed on their legal duty to publish a report on spiking by April, stating that they were reconsidering whether their rationale for not introducing a specific offence for spiking was sound. Will the Prime Minister clarify when and if this spiking report will ever be published, and does he agree with me and colleagues right across this House that the only sound approach to this issue is to create a specific criminal offence for spiking? Madam Deputy Speaker, this is an issue that has been reviewed by legal police colleagues. Uh, I am, uh, my latest understanding is that the existing laws did cover the offence of spiking, but of course I'm happy to ensure that she gets uh, a letter which explains the position. Paul Holmes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Very kind. Not content with being the third most indebted council in England with a debt of 670 million, Lib Dem Easley Borough Council Shame. recently refinanced Shame. their failed One Horton Heath housing project to the tune of £148 million pounds with no houses built Shame. and interest payments of £386,000 per month. Will the Prime Minister now ask Dulac to intervene and independently investigate this development and, and ask for a meeting with the Minister relevant to discuss this terrible decision by Easley Borough Council? Terrible. Yeah. Yeah. Terrible. Yeah. Well, Madam Deputy Speaker, I am aware that some local authorities, including the one he mentioned, have taken excessive risks with borrowing and investment practices. That's why we've taken a range of measures to strengthen the regulatory framework to prevent this from happening, and that includes new powers that make it quicker and easier for the government to step in when councils do take on excessive risks through borrowing. I'll ensure that he gets a meeting with the relevant minister to raise his concerns, because his constituents deserve better. Mary Glyndon. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. 
National Energy Action says 30% of North Tyneside's are in fuel poverty, 3,000 homes have legacy prepayment meters, and we are in the bottom 5% for energy efficiency. But the Chancellor announced no new funding to help people this winter. We're now in Advent. So what Christmas message does the Prime Minister have for my constituents who are freezing in their homes? Yeah. 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 Oh, ma ma Madam Deputy Speaker, as I've outlined, we've provided considerable support for particularly vulnerable families this year and through this winter. We're also investing record sums in improving the energy efficiency and insulation of vulnerable homes through our Home Upgrade Scheme and indeed the Warm Homes Discount, which on average can save people hundreds of pounds in their energy bills when they receive that support. And we're expanding those programmes across the country, including in the North East. Flick Drummond. Thank you very much, Madam yeah. Deputy Speaker. The International Criminal Court Prosecutor, Karim Khan, KC, has concluded his first visit to Israel and Palestine and stated we must show that the law is there on the front lines and it's capable of protecting all. What support will Britain offer to the International Criminal Court to conduct investigations into the conduct of all parties in Israel, <coughs> Gaza and the West Bank before and since October the 7th? Well, Madam Deputy Speaker, as is well known, we are a strong and long-standing supporter of the International Criminal Court. When it comes to the situation in Gaza, we have been consistent in saying that international humanitarian law has to be respected. All parties must take every possible step to avoid harming civilians. And I can say that I stressed this point specifically just yesterday to Prime Minister Netanyahu. Gregory Campbell. Thank you. The Prime Minister is aware that the household tax known as the television licence fee is due to rise in April in line with inflation. Given the ongoing household budget constraints that all our constituents are faced with, increasing childcare costs as well as ongoing unresolved staffing issues at BBC Northern Ireland, National BBC Television, National BBC uh, Radio, is now not the right time to proceed with an even larger 3.7 billion licence fee budget enhanced yet again. Well, Madam Deputy Speaker, we have already uh, agreed a fair settlement with the BBC that will see the licence fee remain frozen until 2024. I think the Honourable Member raises an excellent point, and I've been clear that the, the licence fee in the BBC needs to be realistic about what is uh, possible in an environment like this, and it should only rise at a level that people can actually afford. The Culture Secretary has said we're looking at this issue right now, and she'll set out more detail in due course. We're going to leave Prime Minister's questions there. You can continue watching on BBC Parliament. We are also uh, keeping an eye across Boris Johnson's evidence at the COVID inquiry. In fact, the Speaker today, Lindsay Hoyle, uh, wasn't present in the chamber because he has COVID. It was his deputy, Eleanor Lang, who presided over uh, the proceedings inside the House. Uh, let me welcome our guests for this part of Politics Live. For the government, Kevin Hollenrake, uh, a business minister. For Labour, the Shadow Environment. Secretary Steve Reid uh, and my colleague Leila Nathu, BBC political correspondent. Welcome to all of you. Well, you may remember last week, um, probably Keir Starmer's um, best performance to date uh, at PMQs, and Rishi Sunak really did have an uncomfortable time. This week, he seemed to be more on the front foot as he was questioned about the treaty, the updated, upgraded uh, treaty with Rwanda over sending asylum seekers there. James Cleverly, the Home Secretary, uh, returned uh, from there yesterday um, and we'll talk about the detail of that treaty but first of all Leila what did you make of it? Well I think Keir Starmer was hoping for a bit of a reprise wasn't mm. he uh, of last week a couple more gags in there I don't think he quite nailed it as you said certainly he lent into his uh, admiration for Margaret Thatcher that was uh, mocked a little bit by the Tory uh, benches but I think you know he's trying to put pressure on the government over the Rwanda treaty picking out details in the treaty uh, that was signed by James Cleverly yesterday talking about how the UK will have to take Rwandan refugees as part of this treaty, uh, will have to pay for accommodation and food for five years of anybody sent there. So trying to really unpick and say, look, is it worth the money? Actually, is anybody going to be, to be sent there? And I think that is an important point that Keir Starmer raises the scale of this uh, programme. Rishi Sunak's defence, and I think it was interesting to note how often he mentioned the deterrence word that actually this programme is not actually about the details of it. It's about the existence of it, the operationalisation of it. 
and then the government hopes that will have this big deterrent effect that will stop people coming in the first place. So the numbers automatically reduce uh, by the existence of this scheme in, actual in actuality. What evidence is there that it will be a deterrent if it ever actually happens? Australia? Exactly the same ha thing happened in Australia. <clears throat> proved massively affected. At one point, they had 26,000 people coming over on boats, and that went down to a few and hundred. Do you think that's a direct comparison? People. Direct comparison. Right. Absolutely. I mean, other countries have also tried to set up arrangements with Rwanda. No none of them have happened. As you know, Denmark dropped it. Other countries are interested in the idea of sending um, asylum seekers to a third country, but as yet, they haven't happened. So, all right, you think the deterrent uh, will work. Let's have a look at the details that Leila uh, was laying out there. This upgraded, beefed up uh, treaty with Rwanda in order to answer some of the criticisms, um, and they were pretty harsh, those criticisms, from the Supreme Court ruling. So, £140 million is being given uh, to the Rwandan government. Uh, we now know Article 19 of the treaty says the UK will resettle a proportion of Ra Rwanda's most vulnerable refugees. That's the UK resettling a proportion of Rwanda's most vulnerable refugees. And also, the, uh, a certain number of refugees, if they commit a crime or asylum seekers in Rwanda, they too can be returned here. Wh what's in it for the UK? Well, it's in it for the UK is making sure there's a deterrent in place that people don't think they can come to the UK and access the UK to claim asylum. It's as simple. And as we that. don't know if that will work. <coughs> I, I well, tell you, what, but we don't know if that will work. Evidence, but you can see it's exactly what's happening. But you can see why it's attractive for Rwanda. Why, why is it so appealing here when we don't yet know uh, whether it will work? Because it costs us six or seven million pounds every year, to, mm. every day, mm. to keep people in, in hotels. And who sorts that? Well. I don't think it's actually this government's fault that people are coming across the channel. What we've done but is putting put, them measures, in hotels. put measures in place, put measures in place mm. to reduce the numbers of people coming over. Mm. At a time when the, the numbers of irregular migrants in Europe has increased by 40% this year, in the UK they've decreased by 33% because of the actions of this government. Right. I mean, it, it could be a deterrent, couldn't it? We know that legally the UK has been told that the principle of sending asylum seekers to a third country is lawful. Well, I mean, we could, you could practically hear the clatter of jaws hitting the floor in the House of Commons when people realise, perhaps for the first time, that what the government have done is they've cut a deal with Rwanda to bring refugees from Rwanda into the United Kingdom. Now, every time so far the Conservatives have told us they're going to cut migration legal or, or, le ille or ille illegal, it ends up going up. The last general election they said they'd cut uh, migration. Um, even if cleverly hits the target he's just set, they will end, they will well, end up doubling migration. That's 300,000. That's reducing net migration, now, legal migration, by 300,000. That's right. Which makes doubles from when they said they would cut it. It's right. Would you scrap double. the scheme? It's gone up from double. Well, Rwanda's not a scheme. It's a gimmick. And if, if you look at what, you know, what's, actually, what's actually going on there, they've sent more home secretaries to Rwanda mm. than migrants at a cost of £140 so million. What would you pounds. Do, Seth, Steve? At the cost of 100 I'm going to tell you that in a moment, Kevin. Yeah, I'm looking take forward your notes to it. Now <laughs> and pass it back to Rishi Sunak uh, if you get the chance to, to speak to him. But, but even if they, they send migrants there, and it's capped at 100 that's £1.4 million pounds per migrant mm. they're going to spend. Well, the idea is. Sending a hundred there, just, you don't and who knows how many thing. more we're going to get? We might end up with more. So what? So what we're going to do? Oh, yeah. well, Kevin wants to take yeah. notes and, and tell Rishi <laughs> is to set up a cross-border police force with our colleagues in the European Union and, and beyond, and go after the people smugglers who bring those migrants to the English Channel right. and put them on boats to cross the let, Channel. Let, let, let Kevin answer, but just quickly, the will you scrap the gimmick, as you call it? It's a gimmick and it doesn't no, no, work. But will we you scrap that, it? Well, we will replace it with a plan that works. And the plan that works is a cross-border police... Mm. We won't continue with it because it doesn't work. We'll replace it with a plan. Well, cross-border police force. Stop using hotels to ha house asylum seekers. Uh, eight million pounds a day, three right. million pounds, three billion pounds a year. Mm. And use that money to bring in a thousand more caseworkers in the Home Office to speed up the processing of applications. And then a removals force to remove from the country people that shouldn't be here. That is a real deterrent. Rwanda is a gimmick that right. will end up bringing What's more wrong? migrants What's in wrong with that? that it removes. Because what Steve clearly is not recognising is the European Union, 27 countries, have just agreed a deal to share, to share asylum seekers right across the European Union. Mm -hmm. So you think you can have a returns agreement with the European Union, but won't include quotas for the UK is completely nonsense. We won't be doing it that. Oh, you won't be doing that? No. So how are you going to negotiate with the European Union? It's fantasy. Can I tell you why they, they don't... Hang on, hang on, let me do it and then I'll get you to respond. about this uh, £1.4 million uh, pounds per, uh, per asylum seeker. There's a capacity of 100 at any one 
time. You need to read the policy, Steve. So does so does your leader, the leader of your party. That is not the case. And of course, this, these, these measures can be scaled up as the as the policy is implemented, and it's and the policy has been frustrated every turn by the Labour Party mm. and their op other opposition parties. And and the, and the people I speak to in my constituency do not understand why, because they do support this policy well, as I so do. Are we going to receive more migrants than we <laughs> That's send? That's a complete nonsense. Or do you not know we the are, answer we, to that? We, you are talking tens of thousands do. of people coming over the they channel. Don't know. Uh, tens of thousands Give of people. <laughs> in in Australia's case, twenty six thousand down to a few hundred. That's the reality, Steve. Oh, Right. What Steve's saying is going to be tens of thousands coming across no. Europe every well, let, single let, year. Let, 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 are we going to see bringing people in from Rwanda? It's not Labour. We're not. We're going to. Is, we're going to deal with the policies. situation. Is this going to happen in time before a general election? Anyway. Well, I mean, this is the key question, right? I mean, the, the intention is for flights to take off before the spring, and I think it was interesting to hear Rishi Sunak go on about addressing the concerns of the Supreme Court. It's not as if the Supreme Court said, "Look, we've got some concerns. Go away and have a little fiddle, and then come back to us and your policies." Are we're now back to square one. So yeah. how confident? can you be that with all of these measures there won't be a single legal challenge allowed that would let you get the flights oh. off till well, in the spring? That's not quite where we are. I don't I believe we're back to square one because what the Supreme Court said quite clearly it is illegal to deport uh, asylum seekers to a third country. They said that. Their concerns were what happens then. Right. So we put measures in place through the treaty and through the emergency legislation to make this policy watertight. I'm not saying of course courts are independent in this country quite rightly so we've got to put measures in in place that are that are do what are those measures what are those measures what makes it watertight things like appeal courts so there was a proper appeal procedure the fact that um, the fact that th those appeals can be considered for those kind of asylum seekers they're, they're the, some of the measures in that policy the fact that we believe that Rwanda is a is a safe country for example right. these are some of the measures that are in there to make sure well that the, can that I policy just does work can I just quote you um, and then Leila um, I'll let you back in uh, to ask another question of Kevin Simon Clark was sitting uh, where Steve was sitting before Prime Minister's questions and he insists that the only watertight policy that can be put in place is if we disapply parts of the European Convention on Human Rights, not leaving it, but disapplying parts of it so that they cannot challenge decisions here. Do you agree with him? Um, listen, we've said all along that we take nothing off the table. No, we've got to get this him? right. Is no, we right? don't. Oh. We believe we can do this while, while, whilst observing the requirements of the European Court of Human Rights. So we believe this, this, the treaty we've got, combined with the emergency legislation, does the trick. Right. Would you resign if it was in there? What, that, what kind of question? I'm business minister. I'm not immigration minister. No, no, no uh, but, but, you, but you obviously are part of this government. We had Simon Clark saying it's a confidence issue for him. He's not in the government, well, I understand. I it's agree. a confidence issue for him if, a red line, he said, if in this legislation, if it appears this week, it doesn't state clearly that parts of our obligations to the European Convention on Human Rights aren't disapplied, um, aren't sort of exempted uh, from asylum cases. If... It is in the legislation. Are you saying that you wouldn't stick by that? I'm not saying that at all. I would want to see the situation that arose at the time. You're talking about a hypothetical situation. Well, it's going to happen uh, this week. We're going to know factors. what the legislation... I, I, I'm not... In, I, I'm certainly not saying that if the, if the only way we can make this policy work, the random policy work, is to display elements of the European Court of Human Rights, so be it, in my view. Ah. All right. Well, I mean, on that, I mean, there is a sizable section of the Conservative Party, including Simon Clark, who say that they'll accept really nothing less than that because they don't believe it will work otherwise. Yeah, and conversely, another section of the Tory party yeah. is saying they wouldn't stand by and watch the UK pull back from its international obligations. So the risk for the government is that by trying to tread this middle road is that actually they don't satisfy either camp and actually do something that still enables legal challenges and thereby holds up the policy. They, 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 would, also, they would also cause a huge problem with the US uh, government and Northern Ireland because the, the Northern Ireland Peace Agreement, um, the Good Friday Agreement, is contingent on the Human Rights Act remaining in place and the UK remaining a secretary to the, to the European Convention. So you basically rip up peace in Northern That's Ireland just, just, and oh. damage our relationship with the United States it, it, if you go Steve, down that particular road. The easiest road. job in the world is to stand on the sidelines and criticise it. That's all we get from Lib. <laughs> you never come up with a I plan. I just gave you a plan. You, just, mm -hmm. it, a plan that you were taking notes, well, admit remember, then, to give it admit, to Rishi. <laughs> admit then that if you get a, a negotiation with the European Union, it is fanciful. 
people to think they won't require the Why UK to take a Why are you telling me that come up a negotiation you're not part of? Well, we won't be accepting anything to do that. What are you going to negotiate with? You've just actually do. done a deal. You've got it on paper where you're going you to be bringing of? in asylum seekers from Rwanda to the UK. I think a lot of Tory supporters think, will be quite surprised. Well, 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 let him answer. Let him answer. You honestly think all 27 nations of the European Union are going to agree to take a quota and that they're going to let the UK remain part of that agreement and not take a quota? Yes, I do, because they want to improve relations across the board with the UK after your government started engaging in megaphone diplomacy and putting That's up trade barriers that are damaging both sides. I've been right, speaking well, to on, Steve, on that. I mean, it is a just... goods because of what your can you, So is. you can guarantee that the UK, if Labour wins the next election, you will not agree to anything, uh, rightly or wrongly, which means that we would be part of an agreement to take a quota. No, that's absolutely of... not. I'm, I won't right. be doing the negotiating. It will be one of my colleagues. But that absolutely... Uh -huh. That is not going to be what we will we will aim to do. We I've told you our plan yeah. uh, for for dealing with this situation across yeah, no, border no, no. police heard. force, ending the use of hotels, getting more caseworkers in the Home Office to process applications mm. faster, and a returns unit to remove um, applicants who have no right to be here. Although that will take time, sense, that will really. take time too. I mean, how big an issue is this going to be that? at the general election? I'll come back to you in a second. Well, I mean, if be removed. Hang on. <laughs> 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 well, I mean, I, I think there are many Tory MPs who certainly heard Simon Clark earlier talking about the level of anger that he experiences in his constituency on this, it's clear that this has become a kind of symbolic issue yeah. for the Tory party. It's mm. clear that Rishi Sunak has set himself the goal, the standard, if you like, of getting those flights off before the next election. So it is going to be a huge, a huge issue in terms of how the Tory party will be judged. Similarly for you, though, Steve, I mean, you do have to answer the question of what you would actually do in practice. Is there going to be any kind of deterrent effect in a future Labour I've policy? I've it two times, at least on this show. But what so about far? the deterrent like effect? But the That's not too bad. But the deterrent aspects of it that most it people consider deterrent. needs if to be... If the there. reason the people are coming here in those numbers is because they know once you get here, the Conservatives will put you up in a hotel for two or three years and then 17,000 of them have vanished into the system because they're not keeping tabs. If you process the applications quickly, you don't have to Which pay hotel bills. Now. You don't have to pay hotel bills. Mm. It's still eight million a day. No, no. So, but you they know, are that's doing, quite, but, quite but a lot of public money that should may, be going on public inherit. services I, uh, instead. Right. And if you know that your chances are that you're going to be processed quickly and then sent back, you're not going to come. All right. Uh, return, the problem is they've broken the assignment. Uh, the, the returns arrangements are very difficult, of course, in practice. But can I ask something related to what Leila was saying? If you keep talking about an issue, Kevin, in the way this government has, and the issue is stopping small boats, not, not reducing the number, stopping them, and you've talked and talked and talked about it, has that strategy misfired? Because you failed to do what you set out to do. And perhaps if you talked about it less and hadn't promised uh, a sort of polemic solution, you might be in a better position. Well, Lewis says it's a huge issue for the Conservative Party, and you're saying the same thing. Because you've I, made I, it no, a huge no, issue. I, I, I think it's a huge issue for the country. For the, my constituents, okay. and some of them don't vote for, vote for me. I think it is a massive issue right. for this country. So I think it's absolutely right we focus on it. And, and we are reducing, we are reducing the numbers. Fine. But, uh, but, can I, uh, but this is a tricky issue, not least because we are Clearly. frustrated by, by the politics of the opposition time and time again. Can I just deal with this thing about processing asylum mm. mm. claims more quickly? Mm. Steve thinks that's a solution to the problem. Is. That will act as a draw right across the European Union. That's what will happen. You get more people coming Removing across... Removing failed asylum seekers will... Countries, will hang on, let, let, him let him finish his point. Let him finish his point. Greece, Italy, Spain, France, yeah. into the UK. That's what will happen. You'll get more, Steve, not less. They come here because you're a soft touch, uh, is why the, <laughs> where the, where the reason they come here. Right. And, and it's not just talking about it, because they passed two pieces of legislation so far. This will be the third round if it happens. After each piece of leg legislation, illegal and legal migration got... Bigger. All right. None of it works. All I right. haven't got a clue. We're going to return to the COVID inquiry because Boris Johnson has been giving evidence since around 10 o'clock this morning. We spoke about it uh, before Prime Minister's questions. I want to play you an excerpt from his evidence that he's given in the last hour or so about what he was doing, Boris Johnson, during the February half term, if you can cast your mind back, um, in 2020, ahead, a month or so ahead of that first lockdown. Uh, despite what has previously been said, uh, to to the um, the inquiry by by some uh, some of the evidence, uh, there was a lot going on, and it, it really starts to to mount in tempo uh, around about the time that you, we get um, Catherine Hammond's note of the on the twenty eighth of February. 28th, yes. So the question to you, Mr. Johnson, is this, and and. Nobody is suggesting you put your feet up at, at evening during that week. Well, apart from you, that is. Well, I, I'm, what I'm suggesting to you is, by your very own reference to the fact that tempo increased after the half-term break, 
between the 14th of February, when Cabinet discussed the plans that would need to be drawn up, to the 25th of February, after half term, yeah. relatively little overall was done in terms of responding to this immediate crisis. Was that? I think that the, the sorry, forgive me, I was, Ms. Kitt, forgive me, I was referring to a, a, a conversation I happened to catch on the, on the, between you and a previous witness, in which I, I thought the impression was being given by somebody that I was, I was relaxing during that period. I, was, I think it was Mr. Cummings. It may have been. And not uh, given by me, Mr. I Johnson, forget, but I, by the I, I take it back unreservedly, Ms. Keith. Um, that was Boris Johnson responding to questions about what precisely he was doing uh, in February half term, a month before the first lockdown. Now, we've already heard from Boris Johnson um, that he admits uh, they underestimated, all of them um, underestimated the scale and the pace of the COVID pandemic. Let's get a little bit more uh, analysis with Nick Erdley, who is outside uh, the inquiry. We've just played that exchange, um, Nick, between Boris Johnson and Hugo Keith about uh, what exactly Boris Johnson was doing during uh, the half term leading up to the first lockdown. A sense that perhaps he wasn't taking seriously enough the challenge of COVID. Yeah, I mean, remember this is two days of evidence, Joe, so this morning is focused on the run-up to that first lockdown. And you'll remember there were all those COBRA meetings, five COBRA meetings in total, which Boris Johnson didn't chair. It wasn't until early March that he got involved in those meetings. And there's been quite a forensic look around what was happening at the time and why Mr Johnson wasn't taking the threat of COVID more seriously. And the argument he's been making is that Whitehall as a whole just didn't comprehend the scale of what was coming, that it wasn't in living memory that something like this had happened. So the, the scientists who were looking into this, the civil servants who were preparing, and the politicians who were ultimately making the decisions just weren't in the place where they understood what was happening. There were a couple of quotes that I just want to read you mm. that I thought were really interesting, though, because Mr Johnson did say explicitly that the government had vastly underestimated the risk. And when he started talking about February 2020, when we started to see some of the spread in Europe, he says that at that point, the government should have twigged sooner. He said, I should have twigged sooner. So in that sense, there is a a bit of an admission from Mr Johnson that the government should have drawn the dots more clearly quicker. It should have realised the scale of the challenge and the problem that was coming. That's interesting in the context, of course, mm. of March 2020, but it wouldn't surprise me if it comes up when the, the scrutiny of the decision-making around the second lockdown, mm. which, of course, was delayed as well, when that comes up too. Uh, Nick Erdley, thank you very much. Um, vastly underestimating the risk, the scale and pace of COVID. Yes, there is hindsight, but the idea that Boris Johnson is now saying I should have twigged earlier or sooner uh, about the seriousness of it. I mean, what, there'll be people in despair listening to that, won't there? The, 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 the relatives of uh, the victims of those who died of COVID. Of course, but mistakes are made. I mean, it's so easy to look back and think this is easy and obvious, well, but we were flying blind. Every country was flying blind. We just didn't know what to expect. And I think surely this inquiry should not be about who sent a text message under stress to whom and what it well, said. Well, that isn't. No, but that isn't. Sure, surely what we should be talking about is for future pandemic, do we have lateral flow testing to the right capacity? Do we have the right isolation strategy? Do we have the right vaccine policies? All those things. Surely those are lessons we should be learning. France, Sweden, Australia have already produced their reports. We seem to want a naval gaze, which, if I might say, Joe, just feeds the media machine. It just is the wrong emphasis. We should be looking at how we do it right next time, not who got it wrong and playing the blame game. Right. Well, I mean, it isn't about the blame game. Baroness Hallett has been very clear about that in terms of individuals. But you wouldn't deny it's important to look at how decisions were made and what drove those decisions that led to 225,000 people um, dying from COVID. Flying blind, you're absolutely right, but you, you don't deny that these are important questions of to course, look at. Right. Of course, but it's just the extent of the inquiry. I understand that the report won't be available until 2027. Well... I mean, is that the right thing? We should ask this question. Is this the useful way to spend our time? Well, is it? Well, I, I, I agree with Kevin that we, we do need to learn lessons for the future. That's absolutely right. But also, people who lost their loved ones need answers. Mm. So we do have to find why 
the number of people died, particularly older people. And it, one of the reasons, I'm afraid, you might not like this, but we had a Walter Mitty-style fantasist as our Prime Minister who tried to pretend the thing he didn't like wasn't happening at the time that it was happening. Then when he started to take decisions, we've heard in the inquiry, one day he was, you know, we mustn't lock down, older people must accept their fates. The next day we've locked down hard and he threw the system into chaos. But he wasn't doing it on his own, of mm. course. Many of the people at the top of government today were there with him. Rishi Sunak, of course, was Chancellor of the Exchequer the at chief, the time. the chief medical officer, a, the chief scientific advisor. We had a government advisor. out of its depth and we need to learn the lessons from that. And we could learn more of those lessons if Boris Johnson and right. Rishi Sunak would hand over the content of their phones so that the investigation could see what conversations they were really We're going to have to leave it there for the moment, but of course that evidence will continue today and tomorrow and we will be covering it again in depth on Politics Live. Please join me at 12.15 tomorrow. Bye-bye.